For most of us, the passing of a loved one is a time of immeasurable sadness, grief, and self-reflection. Our memories stay with us long after the dearly departed have left this plane of existence. But for a young man named Donald Decker, the death of his grandfather was not a time of sadness, but one of immense relief. For the first time in a very long while, young Donald felt an air of safety he hadn't known for most of his young life. However, this feeling of safety would be fleeting at best. Immediately following his grandfather's death, young Mr. Decker would soon become intimately acquainted with forces so dark and destructive, it nearly tore his mind and sanity apart in ways that he could scarcely imagine. This is the nightmarish possession of Donald Decker. James Kayshaw was a man that everybody knew not to cross. James had led a hard life capped off by his excessive alcohol abuse. By the time he had started his own family, his alcoholic lifestyle was already ingrained into the tapestry of his family roots. It was a shadowy affliction that was felt by all, especially his young grandson, Donald. Little Donald felt the wrath of his grandfather's temperament for most of his young life, contending that he suffered years of physical and mental abuse at James's hands. This caused Donald to travel down an extremely destructive road of criminal behavior. By the time he was 21 years old, he was already well acquainted with life on the mean streets. That is, until he got the news of his grandfather's death and on the morning of February 24th, 1983, Donald felt a wave of relief as he reluctantly attended James's funeral. The young man felt that with James's death, he finally had a chance to start fresh. In his words, he said, the evil was finally gone and now I was hoping things were going to change. Needing a break and time to get his head together, Donald decided to stay with his friends, Robert and Jeannie Kiefer. One night at the Kiefer's home, Donald reported that he felt a sudden deep chill in the air. The atmosphere suddenly took on a heavy cadence. As Donald fell into an eerie trance-like state, water began to inexplicably drip from the living room walls. Thinking they had sprung a massive leak, Robert phoned the landlord of the property. When the landlord arrived, he was mystified as to the source of the leakage. According to him, the plumbing maintenance on the house had been up to date, and he had never had such a problem in all the time he had rented the place out. Furthermore, there were no direct pipes running through the current area of the house that was taking on all the water. Upon further inspection, the Kiefers and the landlord noticed that the water was not only dripping the walls, but seeping up from under the floorboards, flowing out of the ceiling and even soaking through some of the furniture. In addition, this particular water seemed to defy the laws of physics, running and dripping in all directions, flowing not only down but sideways and upwards. Everyone was at a complete loss for an explanation. The landlord was so troubled by what was happening, he phoned police to come check out the property. By the time authorities arrived on the scene, things had only gotten worse. The water was now coming from all directions, flying up and across the room in large droplets. One officer even commented that no force on earth should be able to make water behave in such an unnatural way. But the thing that seemed to be most bizarre about the situation is that the phenomena seemed to be isolated to the living room as the rest of the house was bone dry. Incidentally, the living room was where Donald Decker was still seated. At a complete loss, the two officers left to file a full report at the station. The Kiefers announced that they were going to walk across the street to a local diner to get some dinner, something to which Donald, now coming out of his strange trance, also agreed to. The landlord and his wife decided to stay behind to search the rest of the house and try and identify the possible source of the leakage. The moment the Kiefers and Donald stepped out the front door, the water immediately stopped. One day later, a close friend of the Kiefers, a woman named Pamela Scrafano, 
stopped by the house to see the mysterious phenomena for herself. Pamela recoiled in fear and suspected that a supernatural force was responsible for the inside rain. While speaking with the trio, Pamela noticed that Donald had an eerie and almost catatonic look in his eye. She began to suspect that dark forces had overtaken the young man's body. Wanting to conduct an experiment, Pamela requested that they take Donald to another location to see if the phenomena would follow him. While seated in a cafe, Pamela blurted out loud that she believed Donald to be possessed. No sooner as she uttered those words, than water began to drip from the ceiling. Pamela retrieved a small crucifix and placed it around Donald's neck. He jumped back, complaining that the small trinket burned. Disturbed and extremely frightened, the Kiefers brought Donald back to the house and once again phoned their landlord. After explaining what had just occurred, the landlord became angry, accusing Donald of engineering a sick prank for attention. Donald argued back, trying to defend himself. With the tension escalating, what can only be described as poltergeist-like activity began to shake the house. Doors slammed open and shut, drawers rattled inside cabinets, and pots flew across the kitchen. Suddenly, Donald Decker began to levitate off the ground to the shock and horror of everyone else. Then, without warning, his body flew across the living room and landed several feet away. Donald would later describe it as feeling a painful, jolting sensation throughout his entire body as he was lifted into the air and thrown like a rag doll. After this violent encounter, the rainwater resumed inside the house, achieving the same intensity, but in much less time. The Kiefers again summoned the police, who in turn brought over the police chief to see the disturbing phenomena for himself. Being already dubious of his officers' claims, the chief dismissed the entire incident as nothing more than faulty plumbing. In fact, he ordered that the officers keep silent on the matter as in his words, this town has enough problems, we don't need to add ghosts and spirits to that list. Acting in direct violation of their chief's orders, the original officers decided to conduct a few tests on Donald. In a ghost hunting version of a sobriety test, they made Donald try and hold on to another crucifix. To their dismay, they found that the minute they dropped the charm into his hands, smoke began to bellow from his palms. When officers tried to take the crucifix back, several commented that the jewelry was hot to the touch. However, this was only the beginning. After the crucifix test, and while the officers were discussing what to do next, Donald once again began to levitate off the ground and again was thrown violently backwards. The police rushed to his aid, but upon further examination, were horrified to discover blood running down his chest, the result of mysterious claw marks that now ran down the length of his torso. A few nights later, with the activity escalating and with Robert Kiefer reaching his wit's end, he decided to summon a reverend to the house to perform an exorcism. As the reverend aggressively prayed, Donald started to convulse and shake. The reverend urged the Kiefers to continue praying, and as they did, Donald's convulsions subsided. Things in the house seemed to return to normal. Even though his outward troubles were calm for the moment, a storm was continuing to brew inside of young Donald Decker. A few weeks later, Donald would be serving a jail sentence for receiving stolen property, and it's here where the supernatural phenomena would once again emerge, with more ferocity than ever before. Within no time, Donald's jail cell began to seep with water coming out of every inch and crack of the concrete enclosure. But with the return of the otherworldly activity, also came a profound change within Donald Decker himself. He was now convinced that he possessed unearthly powers and that by just a thought, he could make it rain. Upon hearing Donald's story, a skeptical correctional officer openly challenged him on his claims. He told Donald to make the water appear in other areas of the jailhouse. 
Simultaneously, one Lieutenant David Keenhold was catching up on some paperwork in his office. Out of nowhere, his shirt began saturating with water from an unknown source. To see if he made good on his claims, the correctional officer who had challenged Donald decided to check in on Keenhold. After discovering what had happened inside the office, the jail then contacted the county chaplain. The chaplain took Donald into a separate interrogation room and questioned him. Initially, the clergyman was skeptical of the young man's story and even accused Donald of fabricating tall tales. No sooner had the chaplain launched his accusations than Donald's demeanor immediately changed a deathly stench enveloped the room. Donald then began to speak in a voice that did not resemble his own. He told the chaplain that he had the power to control rain and that there was nothing he could do to stop him. Donald started to rub his fingers together and immediately drops began to fall from the ceiling. Feeling that he was in the presence of a demonic spirit, the chaplain opened up his Bible and started to read aloud verse after verse. To his astonishment, the pages of his Bible never got wet. After only a minute or two, Donald seemed to snap back to his senses and the rain ceased. The young man broke down and began to sob into the chaplain's arms. He reported that after the chaplain had prayed over him, a sense of calm and peace washed over his mind. Donald Decker felt that he had finally been freed of whatever malevolent force had overtaken him. When questioned further, Donald was convinced that the malicious spirit of his grandfather had something to do with his plight. He felt that James Kayshaw was trying to abuse him in death as he had once in life. So just what are we to make of this bizarre case? Now, many who have studied the Pennsylvania Rain Man, as the incident has come to be called, cite this case as their go-to for proof positive assertion of the existence of the paranormal. They say it is the only case on file of so-called demonic possession that has so many credible witnesses to back up its validity. As of now, Donald Decker has put the incident far behind him and gives very little interviews these days concerning the case. But the rest of us are left wondering, just what did happen in the winter of 1983? Is there some rational explanation to the torrent of a supernatural rainstorm that seemed to follow Donald Decker wherever he went in the weeks that followed his grandfather's funeral? Can the barrier that separates life and death be breached by one's desire to control? Now we may never get an answer to these questions but that doesn't mean that we have to stop asking. After all, that is our mantra here at Penalty of Death, because as you know, we always ask you to question everything and trust no one. Always be sure to come in out of the rain. <laughs>